Watcher 23 introduces several very significant additions to the audio engine, taking its sound generation capacity to places it's never been before. In this video we'll focus on the biggest of these, the Watcher Audio Engine Sample Player. I'm going to use the first part of this video to run through a quick overview of all the features of the sample player. I'll then take a more detailed look at some of its features, highlight some of the things you need to be aware of when using it, and maybe offer some tips and advice on how to get the most out of the unit. I'll put timings in the video description so you can jump about the sections as you wish. So, let's take a look at the sample player. I've set up a generator so I can host the sample player in a synth slot, and opening up that slot shows us all the parameters on offer with the sample player. So let's run through them quickly from top to bottom. At the top are the sliders for volume and pan position, same as all the other TG units in the audio engine. Below that is the sample management section. In the middle of that section is a small display in a grey text which gives you useful information about the current sample, its location and its duration. A short 5 second ambient loop is always loaded as the default. Click on the Load Source Data tab to open the usual Watch Your Document screen. This will show you a list of all the template packs on your system, as well as the Documents folder, which is actually the top level of your Watcher Documents folder, where all your mixes etc are stored, whether that be locally or on the cloud. If there are any compatible audio files in any of these packs or folders, you'll see them listed with a small audio audio icon to identify them. Note that the sample player only plays OG format files. OG is a compressed audio format, kind of similar to MP3 but more efficient. I'll cover how to make your own audio files for use with the sample player later in this video. Highlight a file to audition it. And when you find the one you want, click select to load it into the player. The information panel updates to show you the details of the new source. Now, this is where it gets a bit more wild. As well as loading pre-existing audio files into the player, it's possible to generate new samples for it on the fly. You do this not by loading an OG file, but by selecting a Watcher template file instead. If you do that, then what happens is every time you start the mix playing, Watcher renders a short extract from the template, converts it to an OG, and loads that sample into the player. And it will do that every time you restart the mix. Each new playback renders a new sample. The slider below the information panel lets you tell Watcher how long you want this sample to be, up to a maximum of 20 seconds. Longer times might take longer to render, so there could be a slight pause during the process, depending on your platform and the power of its processor. Personally I've found that anything under 8 seconds is near instantaneous for me on my system, but obviously your mileage may vary. What you get through using this process is unsurprisingly fairly random. Templates that have a clear melodic or timbral change are usually more rewarding than drone scapes etc. And you might also need to adjust the sample player volume levels because the renders aren't normalised. But if you don't like what you've got, restarting the mix will force it to generate a new sample until you find something that you do like. And if you want to freeze that, the final option in this section is to export the currently loaded sample and save it to your documents folder for future use as a watcher template.
It's only possible to use this feature with template files. Uh, there are too many variables involved for this automated process to work successfully with mixed files as a source. But there is a manual way to easily create sample player content directly from mixed files. In Watcher 23, when you use the built-in recorder to recreate an audio file, it now makes both a WAV and an OGG version automatically. So, if you have a great mix that you want to use as a sample, go to the Recordings tab and cook an audio file in the usual way. Both WAV and OGG versions of the results are saved in your Watch Documents folder, meaning the resultant OGG file is available immediately in the Sample Player File Select menu. this is probably a good time to mention file saving in general. If your sample player is loaded with a sample taken from your documents folder, then the sample data is saved inside the mix file. This makes the mix totally portable. Anyone with Watcher can play it on any platform, but obviously it inflates the mix size, which is why the player only uses a compressed audio format. If the sample is taken from a template pack, then the sample isn't saved with the mix. The mix just contains a reference to the sample location. This means that the mix file remains as tiny as it always is, but it will only play black correctly on an installation of Watcher that includes those packs. This isn't a problem when using packs that are included with the installation, but it can be an issue if you are using custom or add-on packs and zip archives. In those cases, you may want to export the sample being used and reload it into your mix from document folder, so that the sample is saved with the mix if you want to share it with others. And that's the file section. Let's move on to the playback modes now. There are five playback modes. The first two are suitable for polyphonic use, and the other three normally need polyphony to be set for one for most common use cases, with a couple of exceptions. Mode one is MIDI note triggered. This restarts the loop every time a new note is received by the player. The sample loops continuously. Mode 2 is the same as Mode 1, but the sample loops in a pendulum fashion. That means it plays forward from the start, but when reaching the end of the sample, the playback reverses back to the start point, and when it flips again to play forward to the end. This is useful when you have a sample where the start and end points are sonically different, as it gives a much smoother sounding loop. Modes 3 and 4 are simple looping modes. The loop plays continuously, either in normal or in pendulum mode, and ignores any note on data. If you are using these modes in a synth slot, it's strongly recommended you set the polyphony to 1, but we'll cover the reasons for that later. Finally, the last mode plays the loaded sample once, from start to finish, when the mix starts to play back. It then stays silent until the next playback. Now that might seem a bit odd, but this was intended for use when you are using multiple cells in a mix. It means that you can trigger a one-shot sample at the start of every cell, which is useful for sound effects and foley and things like that. It's niche, but it's useful in the right circumstances. Just below the controls is the direction slider, which determines if the loop plays normally or in reverse. Although it's a slider, it really only has two settings. At zero and above, the loop plays forwards. At minus settings, the loop plays in reverse. This lets you do interesting things with the audio using control signals to change the direction of the play dynamically. Moving on next is the built-in envelope, 
type. It's a standard ADSR type triggered by MIDI note on messages and is enabled by default. If you want to have a continuous loop playing, you can bypass the envelope by deselecting it, but in almost every case, you will also want to set polyphony to one if you do that. The final section is all about pitch control. By default, this is enabled for control by MIDI pitch. So, with all the defaults enabled, the sample player will behave like a normal sampler for the most part. If you disable MIDI note pitch, you have a drone style looper or an FX player instead. Semitone and fine tune sliders let you adjust the sample pitch up or down from its root frequency. This will often reveal new timbres and sonorities, and often what seemed to be very unpromising as a sonic source can suddenly become something magical simply by shifting it down a few semitones. The pitch offset is useful for when you want to play a sample melodically using MIDI from one of the watcher generators. If you know the root pitch of your sample, and set this to match, then the sample will be pitched correctly when it's playing alongside other generated voices. Finally, we have a portamento slider. When using MIDI note pitch, this slider determines how long it takes for the sample to re-pitch when a new note arrives. It's timed in seconds up to a maximum of 10. The effect is similar to a tape deck slowing down or speeding up. At small values you get a brief little slide between notes, at high values everything becomes very drunk indeed. As far as control synthesis is concerned, the parameters for level, pan, pitch, coarse and fine, direction and portamento are all available as destinations for controllers like envelopes and LFOs. So the potential for interesting and dynamic sound design is huge. And that's our very short overview of the sample player unit. Let's move on now to look in more depth at some examples of how to use it. But first, we really do need to talk about polyphony. If you want to play more than one note at a time in a software synth, there's really only one way to do this. First, you need to make a mono synth with a single voice. And then, for every extra voice you need, every layer of polyphony, you need to make an identical clone of that first synth. So when you look at a polyphonic synth design in the WAE or in most other software synths, you're actually looking just at the top layer. If you want four voice polyphony, there are three other layers beneath, each containing an identical synth design. Incoming notes go to each layer in turn. So in four voice polyphony, the first note goes to the first layer, the next note to the second layer, and so on. The fifth note goes back to the first layer and the circle starts again. You only hear individual notes from each layer, because when the note sent to that layer ends, the sound decays to silence and stays that way until it gets a new note. Now this is exactly how the sample player works in a polyphonic setting. If you put a sample player in a synth definition with a polyphony of four for example, you actually have four independent players running all the time. They get trigger and MIDI note data sent to them in the usual round robin way, like normal oscillators. So if the built-in envelope is enabled, as it is by default, then you only hear one player per note. And if you are using MIDI note triggering, then each sample restarts when it gets a new note, which gives the impression that the four layers of polyphony are synchronised. So the four layers act and sound like a standard single voice. But this is kind of an illusion, because there isn't any real synchronisation between the layers. Each instance of the sample player knows nothing about the others.
So, if you turn the envelope off, you hear all four sample players simultaneously, which is very loud, probably to the point of clipping. And, as they are unsynchronised, they are all likely to be at different places in their playback loop. So it's not only very loud, it's potentially a very confusing sound as well. A bit like this. One, two, three, four, one, four, one, four, two, two one, three, three, two, four, four, three, one, four, two, two one, three, three, two, four, four, three, one, two, four, one. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, four, two, one, one, three, two, one, three, two, three, two, four, three, three, one, three, four, four, three, four, three, four, three, 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 three, if you want a continuous one, loop of any kind, two, it's always best to set three, polyphony on it to one, one, so you're only hearing one version two, of it. Three, I'm not suggesting that you don't experiment four, with this. One, I've had a lot of fun using two, layers of polyphony to do sort of three, Steve Reich-like phase shift effects and weird radiophonic style jump cuts. But if you are using loops and bypassing the envelope, if you have more than one layer of polyphony, then the results will almost certainly be unexpected and will need some careful management of the overall levels of sound. Let's move on now and look about making your own samples. As far as the sample content is concerned, as long as it's in OG format, Watcher doesn't demand very much. Your source samples can be of any common sample rate and bit depth, they can be mono or stereo, and they're not actually capped to a specific length. However, you need to understand that any samples loaded into the player have to be converted to PCM audio and loaded into memory to be played back. Watcher doesn't stream samples from storage memory. So long, high quality samples may take a long time to load and can potentially eat up large portions of working memory, especially on portable devices. Remember that all the audio resources used in a mix have to be loaded into the memory first, and that includes wavetable based voices derived from sound fonts. So my best advice would be to use the shortest sample length you think you can get away with. Generally, with all the compositional tools on offering Watcher, we've found that up to 20 seconds of audio is usually more than enough for most purposes. If you are making your own samples, it's best to avoid silences at the start and end, and try and ensure you begin and end at zero crossing points. Audio editing software is very much a matter of personal taste, and my favourite might not be yours. But if you're new to audio editing for the desktop systems, Audacity is well featured and free, so it's a very good place to start. Once you have a suitable file, then it's just a matter of converting it to OG format and saving it to the top level of your Watcher Documents file, whether that is cloud-based or locally based. New audio files show up immediately in the Watcher Documents browser. You don't have to relaunch Watcher or anything like that to access them. There are many options for converting WAVE to OGG available across most desktop platforms. The options are fewer for mobile platforms in terms of native apps, but a quick search will give you links to many different websites that offer remote conversion services. Now, some of these look more reliable than others, so proceed with caution is what I'd say. As for desktop platforms, while I use a different sample editor to prepare my samples. I always use Audacity to convert them to OGG. To do that, you just open the wave in Audacity, select Export OGG, and tell it where to save the resulting file. OGG encoding only has a single quality parameter. All the samples included with Watcher are encoded at quality 6. This sometimes shows as 0.6 in some converters. This gives results as good as a high quality MP3 encoding for a slightly smaller file size. We'll look briefly at using the recorder early in this video. So here's Watcher's one weird trick kind of thing hiding inside that feature. If you go to the recordings view in Watcher, you'll see a list of all the audio files in your Watcher documents folder. So if you drop a WAV file from any location into your Watcher folder, it will appear in that list. 
If you then click on the options menu to the right of that listing, you'll see the final option is to export the file to OGG format. Select that and you get a high quality OGG copy of your original WAV file. You also get to see the size difference between the original and its compressed variant. Now this is particularly useful on mobile platforms where external conversion apps might be fiddly to use, but honestly on all platforms if you just need a quick conversion with no frills it really doesn't get any easier than this. And that's the end of this very quick run through the sample player in Watcher 23. Um, if you have any questions put them in the comments below. Um, now get off YouTube and make some music.